Shalom, this is Les Lawrence with the Issachar Forum Prophetic Think Tank. Glad to have you back with us, and uh, we'll have a word of prayer and get right into the news. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. You are a God who is rich in mercy. You are the most faithful and merciful God, and you're the only true living God. We exalt you and honor you. We thank you for your Son, Jesus, Yeshua ben Jehovah, Jesus, the Son of God. And we just ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us through the events that are happening in the world today, and in Israel particularly, that we would see what you're doing and know what we ought to do. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, there's lots of things going on. Let's uh, talk about some of them. My, my blog, uh, my most recent blog was called Israel, God's Glory. And I talked about the fact that the uh, real revelation of God's character and nature is seen in the restoration of Israel. Uh, most people are completely aware of the fact that God judged Israel when they, as a nation and as a leadership, rejected the Messiah and rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And, uh, and yet a lot of people are sort of still stuck on that old news. <laughs> and uh, a lot of even Christians are missing the fact that today God is restoring Israel and returning his favor to them. And the purpose he has in this is to actually reveal to them finally in their own hearts that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's actually happening. There are wonderful testimonies of Jewish people around the world and Israelis that are recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, and so uh, that's the good news, and that's where we actually are. We're in the period of prophetic history where God is restoring Israel and showing favor. We talk about that quite a bit. And this uh, article I wrote is called God's Glory. And uh, talk about a verse from Isaiah 46, verse 13. I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. And, of course, we know that Jesus is the light of the world and so forth, but in Israel, God is actually revealing his faithful character. Uh, I, I've always, I've written, I think it's five books now, and I've ended every chapter of every book, I've, of the five books I've written, with the phrase, God is faithful, or Jehovah is faithful, because it's the nature of God uh, to be faithful. He's the, he is the, uh, the ultimate covenant keeper, and he made certain unconditional promises to the forefathers of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would uh, bless them and, and make them a nation, a mighty nation in the earth. And uh, even though they don't deserve it <laughs> uh, any more than the rest of us deserve our salvation, uh, God will keep his promises to Israel, and I praise him for that. There's a great scripture uh, that I was reading this week from Psalm 126, uh, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has, has done great things for us and we are glad. Of course, the word Lord in there is Jehovah, the name of God. Not just a generic term Lord, but the actual name of God. Uh, I've said that many, many times, but... Anytime you see all capital letters for the word Lord or God in the Old Testament, it's actually his personal name, Yehovah. And it actually occurs in the Old Testament 6,828 times. And uh, that's another thing that, that many Christians have missed, that you know, wonderful revelation. Well, let's get into the news. Um, probably one of the more well-known news uh, items this week has been the uh, death of Nelson Mandela. And... Uh, there's a story in just, just today in the, in the Israel media that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Perez of Israel will not be going to the uh, funeral. Uh, they cited uh, the, the late, you know, the kind of the lateness of time to be able to schedule it, as well as uh, uh, the questionable security arrangements. Uh, and uh, that's certainly something we can understand. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about Nelson Mandela is that uh, when he was walking out of prison, uh, he talked about how if he didn't leave his bitterness and unforgiveness uh, behind, even though he was freed from the physical prison, he would remain in prison. And so he spoke of forgiveness. And I checked into his background. I found out that he was raised Methodist, went to a Methodist school. And of course, he went through all different kind of things through his life. But 
but it, it appeared to me that he uh, came to a real understanding of genuine forgiveness, which of course is something that well, we can only fully understand in Jesus. So I pray that he was ultimately at the end a, a, a full believer in the Messiah Jesus. Well, um, there's an article on uh, Israel Hayom. Uh, well, it's actually part of uh, Daniel Pipe's columns. It's a great column called uh, it's speaking about the, the deal that's working with Iran. I, I bring that up because uh, tomorrow, Monday, uh, December 9th, uh, the nations again are gathering, in, this time in Vienna, to continue talking about the uh, Iran deal. One of the things that's kind of slipped off the radar for many people, they, they've all said, oh, good, there's a deal with Iran. Uh, but uh, the actual back story and the truth is that the deal has not actually been agreed to yet. There are still details to be worked out, and they're uh, working in, in Vienna this uh, tomorrow to try to work some of those out. And then uh, that still won't settle it. They're not expecting to actually uh, get all these details sewed up and, and tied up until uh, January or even February in their estimates. And it's then that the six-month clock starts ticking for Iran. So they're just getting three weeks and months here. <laughs> Uh, before the deal is finalized. So they're not only uh, deceiving the West by with this six-month agreement and, and decrease of sanctions and so forth, but they're actually getting bonus uh, weeks and months before the deal even is agreed to. So it's been a bad deal from the beginning. And Daniel Pipes, who's a columnist, I appreciate, uh, wrote an article here on Israel Hayom called uh, Saudis Bristle at o Obama's Outreach to Iran. And he talks about this deal they've been working on and, and uh, it goes into quite a bit of detail. It's a good article if you just Google Daniel Pipes and look at his article about uh, Saudi's bristle at Obama's outreach to Iran. You'll, uh, I think you'll appreciate the article. And the point is that the Saudi Arabia is very, very much concerned about this deal. They think it's uh, a bad deal. And I've, I've mentioned this now for the last couple of weeks that uh, the U.S. is pushing it, but Israel and Saudi Arabia both uh, reject it and believe it's uh, a very dangerous deal for the Middle East and uh, that's uh, unlikely uh, uh, partners there to see Israel and Saudi Arabia agreeing on this but uh, that's how bad the deal really is. Uh, it's good to know we have a few uh, people at least in Congress that are uh, opposing it. Uh, the uh, California Republican and member of the House Armed Services Committee Duncan Hunter uh, spoke on C-SPAN this week in the Washington Journal Wednesday uh, saying tactical nuclear devices that would set Iran back a decade or two are better than boots on the ground. The headline is Representative Hunter says if necessary nuke Iran and he was talking about tactical nuclear devices not a not a full nuclear bomb but uh, there is definitely a, some strong sentiment in Congress the House and the Senate uh, is still very pro-Israel and uh, I pray that they will be able to restrain some of these things that Obama is trying to do to uh, protect uh, Muslim Brotherhood and some of his uh, some of his cronies that he's developed. Uh, there's a great headline in uh, Breitbart News this week, Breitbart.com, uh, with uh, this uh, a story about uh, Senator Feinstein says jihadists will stop hating the West only when they achieve Sharia law. And that's right. That's really true. I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed and thrilled that she uh, made that statement uh, because it's the first time a real top legislator in, in the Senate actually made it clear, uh, as the article says, what motivates our enemies and what used to be called euphemistically the war on terror, and which Team Obama now dubs even more opaquely as the effort to counter violent extremism, uh, she's actually calling it what it really is, uh, an attempt of Islam to conquer the world and, and uh, impose Sharia law on the whole world. Well, the other uh, main thing that was going on this week is that uh, the, uh, uh, John Kerry was in Israel. Uh, he's been going back and forth, you know, shuttle diplomacy. He's been up in Europe with the, with the uh, Iran talks and and back in Israel trying to push the uh, Palestinian peace talks. And uh, there's an article uh, this week on the 5th that says, Kerry lands in Israel with peace talks faltering. 
and, uh, and it, it kind of presents the, what he was there to do and trying to push the peace process. Then a little bit later in the week, you have a story uh, on the uh, on the uh, later that day uh, saying a boss rejects Carrie's offer. Uh, he said he's rejected, and a PA spokesman says a boss has rejected every offer put forth by John Kerry on Jordan Valley security. And uh, so a uh, big article explaining how a boss is refusing to go along with it. Another article in the Times of Israel, Palestinians said to reject Kerry's layout for the peace plan. Um, and uh, then a uh, little later in the week, <coughs> excuse me, later in the week when uh, uh, there's a story about uh, Netanyahu is willing to make compromises, but Abbas is not. And then, uh, so all of this kind of what I would call failure, <laughs> but as Kerry uh, left Israel to, to fly out again uh, at the end of the week, uh, he said, we're closer to the peace process, closer to peace between Israel and the Palestinians than we've ever been. In uh, fact, I shared that in my Bible class this morning, and, and, uh, and one of the people spoke up and said, well, it, it's always true. <laughs> we are closer to real peace. And, of course, we know that the only real peace is going to be when Jesus comes and the Messiah comes back. Uh, then there will be real peace, and we are closer to that than we've ever been. Uh, but uh, I, I continue to marvel at uh, John Kerry's uh, fantasy land of, of diplomacy that he's pushing because there isn't going to be an agreement. I, mean, I just I think that's biblical, biblically, prophetically <laughs> a statement that's true. There will be, they'll say peace, peace, but there'll be no peace. A uh, good article in Israel today, um, and this is just actually a, a new article today in their uh, website, israeltoday.com, or dot, let's see, dot, co.il it's a little unusual uh headline is an expert says israelis don't believe in two-state solution it's pretty interesting because uh it wasn't uh, long ago that most israelis were in favor of the two-state solution uh and thought that was going to bring peace after 50 years of war for the last couple decades that's what israelis thought but uh now is this uh uh, Middle East expert Dr. Mordecai Kedar of the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies says Israelis have almost total lost their faith in the two-state solution to the Israeli-Arab contact uh, or uh, conflict. And um, what changed their minds and, and his his results, his uh, his surveys and his study uh, came up with the answer in one word: Gaza. <laughs> and we've talked about Gaza quite a bit, but. The, the overview is, and why why that's changed the minds of Israelis is because uh, they were they sacrificed greatly to re remove ten thousand citizens, Israeli citizens that were living in the area of Gaza had been some of them settlements have been there, some of the villages and towns have been there for a hundred years, and they had a lot of agricultural and you know, very fruitful farms and so forth. But so ten thousand Israelis were pulled out, so there were no Israelis at all left in Gaza. And that's when Hamas took over, and they started shooting rockets, and they've shot thousands of rockets since the Jews left Gaza. And that really uh, caught the attention of the whole nation of Israel, and they realized this, this giving up land for peace doesn't work. And uh, so they've actually turned on the whole, turned against the whole uh, land for peace and two-state uh, solution idea. And I say praise the Lord that that's, that is the case. Uh, there's some good news going on this week, too. I want to mention a few good news things today. Uh, one is that there was a Norway delegation from uh, Christian leaders from Norway asked forgiveness over Norway's attitude during the Second World War and the fact that they participated in the, in the uh, attempted genocide of the Jews and the Holocaust. And they uh, pledged support uh, for Israel, and they, they actually said they would really be happy to support a new Christian political party in Israel. And we've heard that uh, over the last several years. Uh, Avi Lipkin is a friend that, that's been here a few times and spoken with us. And he's been involved in, in trying to help start a, a Judeo-Christian political party in Israel. Uh, his point is that there are thousands of Christians, especially with a million uh, Russians that have, uh, have become citizens of Israel because of, they have a spouse or uh, maybe both of them are Jews, but their children are Christians. And so 
So there's a lot of Christians among that million uh, new uh, immigrants into Israel in the past decade, and uh, and he believes they would really respond. And then corresponding to that, or coinciding with that, is there's quite a move among Christian Arabs uh, that uh, rejecting their Muslim Arab uh, representatives in the Knesset. There are half a dozen or so uh, Knesset members that are uh, Arab, but they're Muslims, and they're actually anti-Israel. And yet there's a, a considerable Christian population of Arabs uh, in Israel and even in the West Bank that, that are actually pro-Israel, and they, they'd like to be represented by a, a political party that re reflects their point of view. So we, we pray that that will uh, develop. Uh, article on uh, Israel National News this week about uh, a, an assassination uh, that occurred in, uh, in Lebanon this week. Uh, a senior minister of Hezbollah uh, and uh, his um, the uh, he was assassinated they, most I think experts believe it was um, actually somebody connected to the Saudis uh, and those who are opposing uh, Assad in Syria there's been a lot of the spillover of the Syrian civil war into Lebanon and, and this assassination was probably done uh, by somebody like that. Israel flatly denies that they had anything to do with it. Uh, that's different than when they do have something to do with it and they say no comment. <laughs> uh, here they just said they, they weren't involved, they had nothing to do with it. Even though Hezbollah j blamed Israel for it. But uh, there was a warning in this article where uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy Defense Minister Danny Danone promises firm and painful response to Hezbollah attack in wake of senior leaders assassination. Hezbollah began to threaten Israel as a result of this, and, and uh, so the deputy defense minister warned them, uh, Israel is prepared. If Hezbollah attacks Israeli territory, our response will be firm and painful. He was quoted by Army Radio uh, when uh, Hezbollah was trying to accuse Israel of doing it. Um, there's another article in uh, Israel Hayom that uh, talks about the, uh, a little more detail about this this commander, it was a commander of uh, Hezbollah, and it's, it's the guy that was in charge of the drone program, the Hezbollah drone program, uh, that was actually killed near his home, and uh, and that's uh, interesting in the in the sense that he did have a role in uh, there have been a couple of reports at least of drones coming from Lebanon into Israel, uh, and uh, so that's an interesting development. Uh, the Times of Israel has the same story. It says he held a key role in the drone program, and uh, and, and yet the uh, conclusions uh, by the experts are that it was probably uh, Saudi-related, uh, uh, the assassination. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about the peace process. And uh, uh, the European Union, here's a headline in uh, Israel National News saying the European Union threatens action against Israel and the Palestinian Authority if the talks fail. And uh, said they're fed up with the lack of peace, the progress in peace talks, threaten to cut annual aid to the Palestinian Authority, and label settlement products, quote unquote, settlement products. In other words, products that are produced in the in what's called the West Bank or with the Israelis, Israelis called Judea and Samaria. Uh, actually, I don't think their labeling the products will have any effect at all. But I'd love to see them cut off the annual uh, aid to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but but. Stepping back a little bit, just the very idea of the European Union throwing their weight around, feeling like they can, they have something to say about what's going on in Israel, is uh, you know still mind-boggling to me, and uh, you feel like you know it's none of your business type of thing. Well, um, there's a there's a uh, in my blog the one one I mentioned recently, the most recent one I uh, or I wrote one on genocide recently, a week or so ago. Uh, there's an article that, that uh, I found since I wrote the article uh, that the favorite course of terrorists in Israeli jails is genocide. They actually were allowing terrorists to take college courses uh, from jail. Uh, and I think it was the year, uh, yeah, 2011. They stopped the program after that. But in 2011, uh, the most popular course they wanted to study it was genocide. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. And another article in Israel Today, uh, a Nobel laureate says the Bible is the key to Jewish genius. He talks about the fact that 
20 uh, percent or one in five of Nobel Prize laureates uh, are Jews and yet Jews make up less than uh, 0.2 percent of the world's population and yet 20 percent uh, of the uh, so that's a hundred times uh, their proportion of the population are Nobel laureates and uh, and he makes the case that it's because they study the Bible <laughs> And I agree with that. I think it is because they study the Bible and they believe what the Bible says. And, and when they apply it, uh, God gives them great discoveries. And I say, thank you, Lord. Let your word continue to be uh, a light to the nations and a blessing. And uh, then one more uh, article. I'll just finish with this one. Now, this is from uh, the algeminer.com uh, website. Uh, an analysis. Uh, Israel's economic dominance of the Middle East foreign currency reserves dwarf neighbors. The Bank of Israel said on Friday, and that was this past Friday, that foreign currency reserves hit a record 80.59 billion at the end of, billion dollars that is, uh, at the end of November uh, after breaking the 80 billion dollar threshold for the first time in October. In 2004, Israel held only 25 billion in reserves. And uh, that's just another example of God favoring Israel, as I said at the beginning today. And uh, of course, the windfall uh, from its natural gas deposits are only going to add to that as they become an exporter of energy to the world. And to all this, I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you are keeping your word. You are the faithful God. And we, we bless you and we praise you. Thank you, Father God, for keeping your word. Bless and favor your people, Israel. And the Jews, Lord, as you bring them back from the four corners of the earth, right before our eyes. Thank you, Father. And we know that as we see all of this happening, we should look up because our redemption is drawing near. The Messiah is about to come. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Shalom, shalom. See you next week. Bye-bye.